with Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is actress Pippa Scott and artist Lee Jaffe. Pippa Scott comes from a show business background. Her father, a screenwriter, and her uncle, a producer writer, were likely influences. Pippa trained at London's Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, worked in New York with coach Herbert Berghoff, and she appeared in television, films, and on the Broadway stage. Pippa Scott never sits when she can stand. <laughs> Let's talk about acting first. What was your actual big break, Pippa? Uh, really, the, the very first was when, when I was a kid. Um, uh, I was 14 years old, and I, I got to go to Monument Valley to do The Searchers for John Ford. How did that happen at 14? I was in a play. <laughs> I was doing some summer stock and in a play. and. And Pappy, that's what, what we called him, John, Mr. Ford's uh, um, assistant, saw me in it and said, uh, come and meet, meet John because we've got a role for you. And off I went. It was wonderful. So you actually started with the top of the crew. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And then, I'm not going to say you worked down for no. that, but you worked on a level, I guess, with other directors. I, indeed. I, uh, f after that, I went on to do pictures like Andy Mame and uh, uh, Norman Lear's uh, Cold Turkey, and I did a lot of theater work. And I got off the boat from London, um, from the Royal Academy, and you know, I'd heard these terrible stories of, of act actresses having to sort of walk the streets and spend <laughs> years before they were cast. And my first job, I landed my first job in the lead in a, in a play called Child of Fortune, which was Jed Harris's last play. That was, that, was that on Broadway? That was on Broadway, and I, well, I went on from there. But, but the acting fascinated me for about oh, 15, 20 years, but my, I married a man who who had wanted to be a producer. And one of the things that had happened with my father, because he'd written all the Fred Astaire Ginger Rogers pictures. That's what made his uh, career, Indeed. I guess. Or and he made their career. <laughs> <laughs> I think both. <laughs> and I was around um, all of that from my childhood. And my dad taught me how, very much how, the structure of a screenplay worked. It's such a young, really a young um, industry, if you think about it, a young, phenomenon filmmaking and it's it's tough I mean I think writing good screenplays is the hardest thing in the world to do and he taught me about that and so I had a lot to give to to the production area and stopped acting and we made a, a company oh, called you stopped acting then I stopped then but but for, take me back you st were you born here in Los Angeles I was Angeles? born in Los Angeles and as I say born into the into filmmaking that, right. but but the writers end of filmmaking which was always not as uh, not as in the swim, particularly right. socially, as as daughters uh, or sons of you know film stars or directors. But then, how did you get but, to the Royal Academy? Well, my parents were great Anglophiles, and they oh. always believed that the best sort of training in those days was happening in Europe. Although, finally, um, Stanislavski had sort of made his way over to the United States in the actor's studio, and that was just beginning then. So they thought that if I really, really wanted to act, that, that I needed to go to college, oh, I and I needed to deal with my brain, and then I also needed to have good solid training. Um, and then after that, if I wanted to go to the actor's studio, if I wanted I to work in the naturalistic world of, uh, of acting, I could come back and do that. So that's how all of that happened. So but let me get back to the, the writing part yes, of it. because I'd like to hear about that. It, 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 in a funny way, it's more interesting to me to be involved in production. Um, not only are you doing the imaginative work of the acting, but you're also you're also seeing the whole arc of the play, and you're involved with with how it evolves and how it becomes. 
And so my husband and I made a company called Lorimar Productions, and much of my work there was involved with the structure of screenplays and how they worked. And I understand you, you named that company. I did indeed name it. How, do, how did you come up with Lorimar? Well, one of the partners, we, there were three partners, my, my husband, myself, and, and a third gentleman whose wife's first name was Lori. Oh. And we had to very quickly register a name with the state because we were, we were about to produce um, Walton's Mountain, which, which uh. became, uh, became The Waltons, but it was a Christmas special. And we were driving north from San Diego on, on the coast route, and Lori was sitting on my right, and the ocean was to my left, and <laughs> Latin for the ocean is mare, <laughs> and we dropped the E, and, and we, we had been scuffling for, um, for a name for days on end, and both men who were in the front seat, of course, in those days, this was the 60s, yes. said, uh, <laughs> said uh, oh, that'll do, we'll change it later. <laughs> and it was Lorimar and, for the, and, and from it then stuck, on? stuck, right. Exactly. I thought maybe you had something uh, to do with Al, because you have a production company called Linden. Well, no, it, no, it's true, <laughs> but um, uh, it was that simply because that was the street I was brought on, up oh, on as a child. Right. I was production. thinking of the Linden tree. Yes, well, then, well and that's our logo, indeed, is, yes, is, is, is the Linden tree. <laughs> okay, let's go back, let's go back, because the Lorimar became one of the biggest producing indeed. companies in television, and you started with the Waltons, which was very family very oriented. much so, and, very, and and went on to a number of other series and a number of other specials that I'm very proud of. Uh, we did projects like Sybil and Helter Skelter, um, The Blue Knight, and then also the you know the big hits that like Dallas, which but which, Eight is Enough. Eight is Enough was, that, was one of them. That was a indeed. very family oriented. Mm -hmm. Then you started getting spicy. Yes, now you, you now you mentioned Hot. Dallas, <laughs> <laughs> spicy, spicy, and Falcon's, Falcon's Crest, Crest and, right? And and all of those were really great fun to do. But by that time, Laura and I was getting really very big. We, we moved into film production, which this third partner was part of, and that didn't go quite so well, but there is a film that I'm very proud of called uh, Being There, which was one of the one of the projects that I think was even That was even in the better. film part yeah, of it? In the film wing of it. But, and then what but happened? mostly we were known for, for, for production. It was ultimately sold several times, once to um, to the company that owns it, that owned it before Time Warner, and then Time Warner bought it. And you, it's sitting there now. Do you feel sad seeing something develop and then sold? Or no, I think we were all kind of burned out. I mean, I think we were all pleased to go on to our, our, our own things after that, because it was an exhausting pace. There was a point where I think there were like six shows running, seven shows running at once, and to keep to keep that level of activity and quality going was was not an easy uh, not an easy task. That's a lot of writing and uh, and the writing and the writing and because it goes back to what you were saying, you always. were so interested in the writing. I think you played a very large part in making checking all the scripts and and overseeing them and th and, and and talking with my husband and working with him and notes and uh, suggestions and all of that. Mind you, each of these shows, of course, had full time producers by that point, and that was a very important thing for it. But what about your acting? Did your acting apply to those things, or was it basically the writing? Writing background and the business background, I guess. I think the writing background was was what was the most important use of me in those days, um, and the the part that that I enjoyed the most. I'm to this day I'm still a script person and uh, and a development person, and we have a lot of. Uh, of projects that continue. In fact, I'm working with one on uh, with Castle Rock at the moment. And you you say it, it it continues and it continues. Do people stop you on the street? I think one of the most famous parts you played was in Auntie Mame. Yes. Do people still stop you and say, "Are you?" The yes, person? they do. <laughs> do they? And and I have lunch with Joanna Barnes at least once a month. So oh, she so the two of us <laughs> together are quite a scene. <laughs> I've been talking to Joanna about coming on. And she kept saying, "Wait till I write another book. Wait till I write another." Book. I have a scene of you. Do you? Yes, and I want to play it. All right, go ahead. It's the, um, I think when Roger Smith just comes walking in, yes, Auntie and Mame's it, nephew. And, and, and in one of, of Auntie Mame's new incarnations of the apartment. This is her modern period. Okay, let's see that. All right. Hello? Just leave it outside, please. So sorry. You must be Patrick Dennis. Guilty. Are you guilty of all of this? 
Oh, no, no, I'm not the decorator. I'm your aunt's private secretary, Peggy and Ryan. How do you do? Hello. Uh, sorry, I didn't know. I've been away all summer. Been a lot of changes around here. Yeah. <laughs> Leave it to my any man. Where did she dig up this stuff? Oh, this is the only set of its kind in the universe. It's made by the, the famous Danish designer, Yule Lulu. Who? Yule Ulu. You say that to the right fellow and you'll get kissed. Oh, incidentally, congratulations. I hear you're getting married next week. Week from next Tuesday. The old ball and chain. Oh, gee, I wish I'd said that. How about the, the first hundred years of the hardest? <laughs> That's a good one. How about um, marriage is a great institution? Yeah, yeah but, but who, who wants, wants to be in an institution? institution? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's enough of that. Patrick! Patrick, ooh, my ooh, little ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> That set was more fun to be on because, of course, it changed every four days. You know? <laughs> Did you ever try that when you were out dating? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> you also, I mean, as I say, when you can be standing and moving, that's Pippa Scott to me. In fact, we used to be moving together in ballet class. Yes, yes right, years right. Ago, <laughs> years ago. But um, you have a company called Ovation, which is a product marketing or we placement. Have, it, it's the name has been changed to Deloge now, and we were very interested in that whole world of direct response and of, <laughs> of the selling of products on television, and we developed a series of really interesting products, culminating in uh, Suzanne Summers' Thighmaster, which so, was... Uh, so you just, you put those things into, mm -hmm, into different in, markets? In, 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 or did you took, find Thighmaster? Uh, no, we found the Thighmaster. I see. It had existed before I see. Uh, in, another, in another incarnation. And uh, it was really regarded as a full body toner. And we said, no, no, we should call it the Thighmaster because oh, that, that, that's the area of a woman's body that she, <laughs> she worries, or one of them, that she worries the most about. <laughs> Um, and it, it turned out to be a huge hit. And, Very uh, big. So we've gone on to other pr products, and we have a few new ones, which I can't talk about yet. But you have something secret. else exciting that you're working Very on. Very exciting. I've, I've never stopped um, being interested in film, and a great friend of mine called me one day and said, um, you've got to come and help me. And I said, why? And she said, I've been made head of the Women's Commission for Refugee Women and Children. And oh. I said, good heavens, what's that? And she said, well, it's a, it's a subsidiary of the International National Rescue Committee, which is the single largest relief organization really in the United States, um, and a single largest non-denominational one, I should say. And uh, it, but this is an advocacy group only. They don't do any relief work, but they work with women and children because 85% of the world's refugees are women and children, but huh. the people who make policy about mm -hmm. them are not often aware of their particular needs. I mean, for example, there are women in the world in refugee camps who may not talk to a man um, even if he's a doctor, except um, unless he's her husband or her her her, her brother, because of cultural because of cultural needs. So, so she said to me, "Come and help." And I said, "How can I help?" And she said, "You'll figure it out." And I said, "What do you do?" And she said, "Advocacy." And I said, "Why don't you advocate in a 21st century way? Let's do it on video." Right. So I did a whole series of videos for for the um, the Women's Commission, and the Helsinki Commission saw them in Washington, and said would I get involved with a man who was in, wa in uh, Chicago who had put together this huge database <laughs> Uh, for the war crimes tribunal uh, oh, yeah. uh, about so the former Yugoslavia. But he had a great deal of film and he didn't know what to do with it. And so we've been creating the archives for oh, for great. the tribunal and for the United Nations and that's been very interesting. That's great because they've used a lot of that, those kinds of films in the Holocaust museums, yeah, Well, cetera, this is a so. kind of another Holocaust, yes, isn't so that's, it? Yeah. yeah, it really is. Uh, our time is up. Uh, and I want, I want everyone to know that you're an architect, too. You have yes, a master's true. degree, and I'm going to leave the audience with, how does an architecture degree help this woman? <laughs> structure. It's all structure. <laughs> Thanks so much for being with us, Pippa Scott. Don't go away. We'll be back with Lee Jaffe. You see his art on the set right now.
I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with artist Lee Jaffe, who was born in the Bronx. He attended Penn State University, made several films from 1969 to 72, and then went to Jamaica to be a member of the Bob Marley Whalers, actually living with Bob Marley. Now, how was a boy from New York accepted into this Bob Marley group, Lee? Well, for me, it was really kind of easy because um, first of all, it's like a, it's this tropical paradise. <laughs> but, totally, you know, that, yeah. So that, that part was easy. And then they're um, um, from, this, uh, from a Jewish background, and the Rast is, uh, the, it's all about the Old Testament. Oh, so, so it fit into your... Yeah, and um, I have to say, it, but uh, they like to smoke a lot of pot, <laughs> which I used to like to do too. So it was like... It was heaven. I think you missed one point. One point was that you were a great musician. I think he well, really I don't respected know. I don't your... know about that. Well, I know you won't say it, but I think the point, one of the points was he respected your harmonica. Was it harmonica at the time? Yeah, it was a kind of a novelty for him. I didn't know what... I, I wasn't there. I didn't see it, but these are the things I've read about how he had this great respect for you and how you were able to just move... Um... Well, I, don't, I wouldn't say I was some great musician, but Bob, Bob played guitar and, and I played harmonica. And one of the things about... Bob and what helped to make him so great was that he was so open to um, uh, new influences. Oh, is that? You know, so I was, I was coming from playing the blues and um, reggae is kind of very much like the blues, the, the chord progressions, it's based on the same kind of chord progressions and just the rhythm is different. Well, were you a musical... Um, um had you studied a lot of music? Well, um, I mean, what, did you study music in school? Uh, well, I, I took guitar lessons. <laughs> My mother used to make put me on the subway, make me take guitar lessons every Saturday when I would have preferred to be playing baseball or something. But instead of playing baseball, you were playing guitar. Were you painting at that time? Uh, no, this is when, like, you know, from like seven to eleven. So you were, you did have a musical base yeah. anyway. Yeah. Did you play any other instruments? Uh, no, and then I started to play uh, harmonica when I was in, in college. And then the actually, whole thing. I dropped out of college at one point for like um, six months, and I was just hitchhiking around, and I wound up in Boston, and um, I was in this club, and uh, it was the first Paul Butterfield blues band. Oh, that's and how. he was playing with a with um, with a microphone. And making this like tremendous sound, and I said, "Wow, I, I really want to do that." So then you just so did just it started, yourself. Yeah, I just started playing constantly all the time. I played till my lips were get bloody. <laughs> do they, literally, do they really hurt like that? So, well, you lived down there. You learned reggae. You played with the Whalers, and then you produced some records. Did you produce um, Marley records, or was Peter no, but Koch? I, I know. But Peter, Peter. Peter was a member of the original Whalers, and then when he left, uh, I went and worked uh, <coughs> co-producing his first album and helping him like, get his, his solo career launched. You were already gone then from Jamaica. No, no, this is in Jamaica. Oh, it still was there? Yeah. Well, you, <coughs> you produced several records. Joe Higgs, too? Joe Higgs, uh, <coughs> yeah. I, I did two albums with Joe Higgs in, in the 80s. And uh, I'm really proud of them. Uh, Joe Higgs is the original, one of the originators of reggae music, oh. and he helped form the Whalers, and he was Bob's mentor. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, so Taught he was Whalers. much older, or not, was he? Not much older. Like the Whalers started when they were uh, teenagers, when they were oh. like 16, oh, and see. Joe was like 21. Oh, he was so he <laughs> was much older, but he was already an established star. <coughs> I see. And uh, like he found them, they, they all came from uh, Trenchtown. I see. A uh, particular ghetto in Kingston, and a joke uh, put them together. Although uh, Peter and Bunny, with, there were three in the original Wales. Peter and Bunny were uh, half brothers. So they and um, Joe kind of got them together with Peter, and 
taught them how to sing harmonies, taught Bob how to play the guitar. Really? Well, Joe must have approved of you because he let you produce his records. Yeah. <laughs> so that worked out very well. Now, let's get, when you were making films, were you using music in the films too? Was this part of the background of the filmmaking? Uh, well, was, the filmmaking was art related. When I was in college, I was uh. studying art and, um, and I, I was making sculpture. And um, at the time, in the late 60s, uh, it was Vietnam War time and it was also con <coughs> conceptual art time. And it became a kind of political statement not to make uh, objects, right. art objects. <coughs> so um, the art led me into making th non-object things. So it was a matter of how do you document them, and it, it, you, oh, you is did that it with film. Was? Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. So the films were art-related. Well, then that art went on. Um, I mean, your career started. And you're so, one of the artists who is so well known in Europe, Finland, Norway, England, Paris, you've had shows in many, many countries. I know you've had shows in, in America too, but it seems like you're more readily accepted or, or grasped in Europe. Is there a different mentality? I don't know, well, museum-wise, I think, you know, they've had all these the series of museum shows there over the last uh, two years, my first museum shows. Um, Your first so, museum shows came in Europe. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe America's going to catch up now. I had, a, <laughs> I, had a, I had a show at Ace. I think it was good. Right. It, it's it kind of like a museum show because right. Ace is like a the space is like a museum. Mm -hmm. And you have um, this wonderful catalog that came actually from out of the European shows. Yes. And I think there's a couple of pieces in there. Were the museum shows retrospective, more or less? Did they go over a period of time? Um, it had some older pieces, but most of the work was uh, very recent. In the 90s? Yeah. Of course, you know, for, like from 72, when I moved to Jamaica, I, I didn't do any art right. until 1983. So your art so. career is at, literally a short career. Yeah. And that's why I'm so amazed with these great um, museum shows. So let's see one of, I think, the first one you want to show us. Well, I'll show you this one. It's called um, Painting for the Man Who <coughs> Lost His Socks. And what it is is, it's a painting um, I made mostly with wax caustic and it has a laser beam that shoots out of it and um, <coughs> into this pair of socks and it has a, uh, a smoke that uh, emerges from the socks which are sitting in this lead box. Does it go off all the and time? The, or do the, you have the smoke slowly uh, kind of oozes out of it and then the smoke picks up the laser beam. Oh is that it? Yeah. So did they have, was this in one of the installations? Yes. This was at Ace. This was at Ace. Yeah. And we have something on the set, too, that's totally different. That's object, right? Well, there's painting behind it as well, but it's a combination of uh, materials. This is also, in a way, I see a lot of writing on there, is it? Uh, well, yeah, I sort of had this period of... Um, uh, being obsessed with writing my name or signing people's names over and over again, <coughs> not my name. Is it your name? Not my name, no. Oh. But uh, I, I made this installation <coughs> for the show in Sweden, uh, which is about boxing and mm. about boxers and a kind of homage to uh, um, these 15 boxers um, whose careers are mostly in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, the time when I used to watch growing up uh, so there were actual the Friday boxers. Night Fights on they TV. They were actually? Yeah. Um, so kind of heroes from my childhood. Uh -huh. And uh, I wound up signing their names on these giant panels. And this is some small uh, drawings and etchings that I made at the this? same time. That's uh, Jersey <laughs> Joe Walcott. Oh, it is? Yeah. Does, does the color 
remind you of Jersey Joe, or is there something about it that, uh, as opposed to no, this? No, the color reminds me of blood. Does it? I mean, it has the, you know, Jersey Joe like getting belted. It's, a, it's, it's catching him in that instant. And then the writing, it says Sucker Punch. Oh, is that? And it's etched, so it's printed uh, backwards. Oh, I see. And then the one uh, right behind you? Yeah, that's Ezra Charles, another oh. hero of mine. He was a, he was a really good uh, jazz musician. He was a horn player. And um, he, he died, he, he jumped out of a, a hotel room. You know, th those names, when you start talking about the names, are familiar names. And I don't know if anyone's ever used them. I mean, I'm sure they've been painted before, but in a different kind of uh, art sense that you're presenting them with now. Yeah. There's another hero, and we don't have too much time left, but I, I wanted to see the one uh, painting that you did with several black... Um, uh, blind musicians? Yeah, blind musicians, because I think that's really fabulous. Yeah, these it, it are the guys who I used to <clears throat> listen to when I first started playing. And um, it's a homage to these five blind musicians called um, um, Blind Boy Fuller, <coughs> excuse me, Blind Boy Fuller, Blind Lemon Jefferson, uh, Blind Willie McTell. Um, did you know them? Blind Arthur Blake. No, these guys lived in the 30s. Oh. So um, this is... It um, has five speakers with uh, the sound oh, of see. each of them singing, which I um, made tapes, uh, which are like a half hour long, each one. So we're going to have to hear those tapes when, some other time, because yeah, okay, we well, ran out of time. <laughs> yeah, no, because I wanted to, to talk about them, but I wanted to let everyone know what Lee Jaffe does besides music and art. So, Lee, thanks for being with <laughs> us. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for writing. We'll see you next time. That was fast. <laughs>